simple uh, things might be like how you treat seeds are really important. You want to maintain the native microbes on seeds. You know, we have a, uh, I mean, we have a, this uh, uh, habit or practice to produce seeds, to when those seeds are mature, to take them off the plant and to take them in and store them in a dry place. Well, actually what happens when you do that is uh, the, the microbiome doesn't develop on those seeds. There's a, what, what, what we call is an after ripening time. And that is that it takes time out in nature uh, with water, with moisture, with uh, you know, cool and warm temperature kind of variations, uh, splashing from the soil, uh, colonization from other parts of the plant, uh, it takes time for the the microbiome to mature and for all the the community of microbes that's gonna that it will colonize it will be on that seed to get on the seed and uh, if you store the seed if you have too much hygiene those microbes don't develop there those and those microbes are very important for the seedling in terms of its early development you know I mean, what happens is you leave the plant the seedlings vulnerable to disease and so one of uh, one of the things that we did when we started agriculture is we started saving seeds and trying to you know store them in places where they were away from moisture and so forth and that actually reduces the community of microbes on those seeds and makes them more vulnerable to disease and uh, they also don't develop properly and you know when, oh, when you put them in the soil then they don't have the good microbes with them yeah so I mean, there actually Holy was cow. a study. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. There was a study uh, of a wild uh, tobacco that some investigators did in Utah. And they took this wild tobacco, this little wild tobacco, an annual tobacco. This was published, uh, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, it was published in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And uh, uh, what they did is they took this wild tobacco from nature and then they started cultivating. They put it in cultivation. And each year they would collect the seeds, they would take them and store them for the next year. It was an annual to tobacco. Then they would plant them again the next year. And you know, this is in Utah, they were doing this, so it's pretty dry. Uh, and what they found is about after about seven years, they found that the the they started having a disease. It was a uh, of wilt disease and uh, the the it started wiping out their plants and then they went and they started looking at the plants comparing them to the wild plants and what they found is that the plants that they had cultivated they were just seven years cultivation what they found is that those plants were losing microbes because of the way they were processing and they were losing microbes and so they started having this disease. And so what they did was they then took these microbes, certain ones off the wild plants, put them back on their, their cultivated plants. And voila, their wilt disease was cured. So this is, this is what's happened with agriculture. And uh, in fact, you're gonna, this, is, this, this is gonna blow your mind, actually. You know, this is what happened with corn. And uh, with corn, you know, I mean, we, you know, we like to think there is, there are biodynamic ways to grow corn and uh, grow it with, uh, with microbes. And, but actually, the, even from the very early days, the Indians, the, uh, the Cherokee and the other Indians actually had ways of Good stored in the microbes. ground. Uh, well, they, they may have done that. They stored it. They probably did store it in the ground. You know about that, right? Right. Well, they also would do this. They would also go out. They they called this the Cherokee called this the corn medicine. Cherokee corn medicine was called. But they would go get wild grasses and things like Phragmites and uh, and Hystrix, the bottle brush, and the uh, Elimus, the Canadian wild rye, and stuff like that. And they would get the roots of those plants, and they would take those plants and they would put them in the roots in the water. And sometimes they'd heat that up, heat that up, so they get rid of a lot of the bacteria, but they keep bacillus there. And, that, and the heating would wake up the bacillus. And then, listen to this, Matt, 
they would then take their corn and they would put it in this water from the they got from these other roots and then they would germinate their corn and then they would take their germinated corn and they would go plant that and it, they would have had a better effect with their corn and they would reacquire those microbes so they were doing you know this microbial kind of of uh, you know this microbiology microbial agriculture and but to them it was magic you know this oh. was the magic this was this was magic you know this was cherokee corn medicine you can you can read about that in uh, there's a book by an old cherokee medicine man uh oh my god i don't i don't have it here i don't i don't know it's called the, the lonesome it. dove or something like this Lo something lonesome dove lake or something like that lake i don't know i could I, wow i could send it to you afterwards so i wasn't prepared to tell you that story but so you got uh, it anyway uh, uh, well i am so excited about this so grateful because so many of of the people that i know are drying their seeds you know sometimes out in the sun the solarizing them they're they're uh, drying them out it's oxidizing those microbes and then I have friends who are talking to me about the fact that part of the reason that we don't have the nutrition that we have used to have in our plants 50 years ago, 60 years ago, was because we've lost the endophytic microbiology and it's translated from season to season in the seeds. And so he's all focused on getting it back into the plants and everything, but the linkage between seasons of how we treat our seeds is so incredibly important. I'm a seed person. I used to be a representative for Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. And we've talked about things like using compost tea to spray down on our seeds before we dry them down. And that's okay in my mind now, but not perfect because you could be displacing things. And then if you've got a, you know, a bacterial dominant tea, you could really screw things up. And it's more, more, it's more like the IMOs, the natural farming IMO cultivation that, oh, that Cherokee story is so incredible because that kind of root soak, you know, taking uh, the, the IMOs from other plants is so rigorous now i mean like this is what we're doing in order yeah. to get uh, microidal and, fungi and, and actually i i hate to say it but uh what the cherokees were doing is actually better than what we are modern people are doing because they were getting a whole community of microbes that are adapted to grasses you know they were going to these wild grasses and the other thing they were doing because they were heating they were getting rid of a lot of these other bacteria and focusing, concentrating on the bacillus, right? Yeah. So they were getting all these bacilli and uh, getting, putting them back into the roots. And so they got a whole community of bacillus that uh, maybe from different grasses, uh, just one grass. And uh, uh, whereas we in our modern methods, you know, of course I'm as modern as everybody else, uh, takes one or two or three or four microbes, right? and right. use, use those, you know, when, when really this wild method, the Cherokees, the, the Indians, and, you know, Cherokees weren't the ones, I mean, they're the ones that we know about, but probably all the corn-growing Indians figured out how to do this, most probably. You know, we don't know everything about it, you know, and most people don't write anything about this, you know, the superstitious stuff, you know. <laughs> but they were doing, you know, uh, plant microbiology. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. So uh, we're w working actually with a corn breeder, organic corn breeder named Walter Goldstein on trying to get some of those microbes back in. And uh, I was just waiting to see if you were, if you responded, see if the person you were talking to was Walter, not somebody else though. No, I was talking to Michael uh, Collins, one of the first uh, farmers for Chez Panisse. And his whole thing was, he would go down to the Amazon and he was looking at what they were doing there to make terra preta and still the traditions that kind of lent itself to what they used yeah. to do to try to trace that history. What's interesting, the overlap there is they're, they're making chicha, but they're brewing it over low heat in these clay ceramic giant um, like um, uh, pots essentially. Uh, and the grandmothers yeah. are going around spitting 
in the bruise. <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah, and so he was telling me all this stuff. Like, There's a lot of layers. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, they must have figured out that that's necessary in some cases. You yeah. know, that may be spitting in it after it starts to cool down. I don't know. I don't know the timing. The re question. Yeah, the timing may be important because they may have killed a lot of the microbes and then and then you know you'd have bacillus surviving but then if they spit in it they re-inoculate it with a lot of other bacteria yeah yeah they may be and like you, chewing something when they do it as well i don't know they could be yeah chewing root chewing a root or something like that you're absolutely right they may be getting microbes out of other plants by chewing them yeah no that's interesting what they what they do no i mean in fact that might if they're chewing plant roots and then spitting in them as they heat it up, see what happens with bacillus is heat activates bacillus endospores, and uh, so you know the process that I said about root about bacillus actually burrowing through the cell walls and going in between the cells and the root. Right. So plants can be filled with these bacillus endospores because of that process. And so the roots, if they're chewing on roots, there's probably a lot of spores there. And then if they're spitting it into some boiling or some hot water, that then activates those spores and germinates them. So, so they could be uh, essentially pasteurizing whatever it is they're cooking, right? Water plus other nutrients in there and then putting their endospore mix from their chewed roots in there. I mean, I don't know what they're doing. You'd have, we'd have to study well, it. Well, chicha is exactly. corn beer. So chicha is corn beer. Yeah. And what they did was over these yeah. pits, they would cook it. And over time, what happened is all these pits basically turned into these um, fermentation areas because leaky pots, broken pots, they would turn them into compost heaps. And that's kind of the, the theory behind um, where Terra Preta came from, because we don't actually know. We've got these observations and we're trying okay. to link them behaviorally. Okay, I see. But yeah. we don't really know. Because <laughs> yeah. we haven't seen but There's it. a lot of microbes. There's a lot of microbes in that, those remains, essentially. That's the remains of their fermentation process. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's like the corn yeah. mash. So they've got the... They yeah. probably have, you know, the cerveza yeast, uh -huh. which is endophytic. Yeah. Um, they, they have a bacillus. Um, and if they're, you know, doing anything with milk, I mean, they would lack the bacillus, right? Um, or even you'd have grain, to, you'd right, have can to, do that. You'd have to really get out the, you know, find out what they've got. You get some samples. and That's, and, that's, uh, that's what everyone's been talking about. Yeah. Yeah, there's different kinds of yeasts too. There's a, you know, it may not be all one yeast. It could be a mix of yeast, and it could be bacteria mixed in there too. More than likely, that's what you've got. It's a complex community of microbes that's doing a doing a thing on that in that system. But then, as the as the alcohol level goes up, you know, a lot of those microbes could be knocked out, and except for except for some of the yeasts that could survive. But I think the low heat actually also prevents it from getting too alcoholic. Oh, um, really? I, I think. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, there, there, it's an open top. I mean, for I've done, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a drinker, but I know how to make alcohol. And you've got to like yeah. take it through a first fermentation and then you have to cap it yeah. to get it to that higher yeah. level where people get drunk. Okay. Um, but but yeah no it's it's so fascinating and their techniques are so there's such a, a hidden complexity to half of these techniques where it's like like they're spitting yeah but they may be chewing something or you know what i mean or they just drank a tea or something yeah, like yeah. that right yeah. it's amazing yeah. i think that the the seed insight that you gave is so incredibly valuable I know that there are people suggesting that you can spray flowers to um, infect the seeds for the next generation, but wow, that's just so incredible. So, it, so you still would keep seeds in a cool 
dry, dark place, and then you would use a root soak system to I would, I would say that's the reality that's the yeah. reality of uh, you know we're not going to change how we get seeds right but putting microbes back on those seeds would be something that makes a lot of sense you know we have we've have really uh you know we've lost the microbial partners to a lot of our crops because of the way we treat seeds and uh, even to some extent, we've gone, you know, to uh, like uh, in a, uh, tissue culture approaches where we produce almost totally sterile plants mm. and then and then try to try to take those. And of course, you know, what we've done is we've made our made our plants more dependent on agrochemicals, on pesticides, you know, to keep them. Whereas we know from our experiments that we could, if we have the microbes there, we could cultivate, uh, at least in the laboratory under experimental conditions, we can cultivate plants totally without agrochemicals, just using microbes. And the microbes, many of the bacteria, in fact, some of the bacteria will go out away from the, and these are rhizophagy cycle bacteria, they will go out into the soil and they will colonize pathogenic fungi and they'll, uh, cause those fungi to leak nutrients and they become weak. And so they're no longer virulent, they're no longer pathogenic. So these same bacteria uh, can defend the plant uh, from, and, and basically all they're doing is they're colonizing the fungus, the fungal mycelium, and they're making it leak nutrients. And we know that because the fungi, the bacteria will grow on the surface of the hyphae. And uh, the, the fungus in the soil won't sporulate in the soil. So basically, we think that using microbes alone, we could cultivate plants. You know, I mean, you know, one crazy vision of the future is we could dispense with all the agrochemicals and use our microbes, use our microbes for nutrients, use our microbes for disease control, you know, use our microbes for stress tolerance because certain of these uh, rhizophagy cycle uh, uh, microbes, when they go in, cause the plant to secrete reactive oxygen, right? That causes the plant then to upregulate uh, reactive ox stress, oxidative stress tolerance genes. And so the plant then is automatically uh, tolerant to like heat or, you know, high salt or other kinds of even pathogens, other kinds of, because most stress is oxidative stress. And so because these plants are doing rhizophagy cycle, they're using reactive oxygen to control those microbes, they're more hardy, they're hardier. 